Bob with Laguna Tools. Uh, boy, we've got a great video for you today. If you'll notice here, I'm, I'm using a label printer. This is a brand new option that's part of Mosaic and it's really exciting. You know, this new feature from Mosaic is, is really timely because I wanted to do a video about becoming a CNC cabinet shop and specifically how you become successful at that and some of the apprehensions that as a business owner you might encounter. The machine we're using today is the flagship of our product line for cabinet shops. It's called the Laguna Smart Shop 2. This particular model is a 4x8 configuration. They come in 4x8, 5x10, 5x12, and we can do custom stuff too if you want. But typically a cabinet shop is either going to be a 4x8 or 5x10, depending on what your material needs are. The Smart Shop 2s are available with a number of spindle options. The one on this machine is an HSD 12 horsepower. HSD's claim to fame in spindles is that they have a bearing package or a module that is replaceable. So if the spindle bearings go out, you just replace that module. And sometimes you don't even have to realign the spindle. It's, it's, it's really designed to be simple for maintenance. This machine has an eight position automatic tool changer. In cabinets, we typically use three or four different tools on an on a average nest, so it's really nice not to have to worry about manual tool changes. Uh, let's talk about how you justify the price of an automatic tool changer. It's real simple, actually. Okay, if you're paying someone to run the machine, which is very common in shops, the automatic tool changer frees that person up. So think of it this way. Once you start the cycle to cut the cabinet out of the nest, it may take six minutes, it may take 10 minutes. It depends on how complicated it is. With an automatic tool changer, that machine runs automatically. That operator <clears throat> can do another operation. That operation might be hinge, hinge insertion, drawer, those kinds of things. And if you really think about it, if I'm paying the operator to run the machine, that was free labor. The smart shop models all feature vacuum tables and generally they come with a vacuum pump unless you already have one or you don't need it, it's a special application. This particular machine has our universal vacuum table that has six control vacuum zones and that's why you'll see six valves on the front and there's also a T-slot system integrated into it so sometimes you may want special setups that require that. The whole idea was to design something that you could do a lot of different things with. The Laguna Smart Shop 2's feature the Laguna Touch control system and we designed that specifically to try to make a user experience that was very simple. So that means the control is very easy to learn and it's very easy to operate. And our idea was to, to have a machine that a typical worker could be successful with that you don't have to hire a worker with special, extra special skills on the machine. The Laguna Touch Control has 10 buttons and a touch screen and that's all it takes to operate the machine and it's been a tremendously successful system for our customers. Machine maintenance on smart shops is real easy because it has centralized lubrication. You know I've been in CNC routing for wood for over 20 years and that's why they call me Router Bob. It's just stuck with me. During that period of time I've done a lot of machine installs at customer installations and there's some things I've noticed that, that have been universal and it's really not dependent on how much the machine costs. You know, this could be a $25,000 CNC, it could be a $250,000. The, the things that you see are, are the same. And one thing, if you're, one of the, if you're viewing this uh, video and you've got a machine on order, you're thinking about it, um, as, as it gets closer to install, you become apprehensive. And, and it's, it's about this, it's, it's not the money normally, it's about are we going to be successful? Are we going to be able to take that investment and make parts? Is it going to do what I think it's going to do? And so it turns out when you do an install, the most important thing is to cut apart our cabinet arcade and put it together. There's nothing more important than that because once that happens, everybody relaxes. You know it's going to work. 
you know, during that time, I've noticed some characteristics of companies that it went really well for that were successful. And at Laguna, we basically came up with a philosophy idea that we call the Laguna Formula for Success. And if you do that, things are going to go pretty good for you, and the odds of you being successful in, with a CNC right are very high. The one common characteristic of these shops that had really successful, easy, smooth implementation is preparation. They were prepared for the machine when the installer said, we need to make something. They were ready to make a cabinet. If we're going to be able to cut a cabinet as soon as the installer says we're ready to make something, that means beforehand we have to have the software set up. You know, one of the most popular cabinet softwares is Mosaic. We have literally hundreds of customers that use it very successfully. So let's address this preparation for the install using Mosaic. And I'll show you how I set it up. And I'll tell you what to do and what not to do. Mosaic has very high quality online training videos. You watch those videos, that will teach you how to do every part of the software. If there's an area that is not covered or you don't understand, make a list of that. You also get two hours free of online training uh, with them to help you solve those problems. All right, if you need more training after that, it's $75 an hour. Mosaic is a pay-as-you-go software, so you don't pay a, a huge amount of money up front. If you need additional training, it's certainly available. So this is the mosaic screen that you see. And actually, before I even start a job, I come up here and, and I go to libraries. And let's explain what some of these do so that you understand it. You'll see something here that says products. You'll see something that says materials. Let's take a look at materials. Okay, materials are what you might think. They're plywoods and panel materials and solid woods, the kinds of things you make cabinets out of. Now, I'm going to take this first row here because our cabinet that we're going to do is going to be at three-quarter plywood. Now, this tells me what size of sheet is, so I have to make sure that's correct. How thick it is. Now the thickness is critical because mosaic creates joints based on the thickness. So you want to make sure that it's thick enough. Now I'm going to give you a little hint here in the first cabinet you make. Make it thick. If the, add about five thousandths to the material thickness because here's why. If the joints are too loose, I can live with it. If they're too tight, I can't. All right, once, once we make a base cabinet and put it together, then we know where our material thickness is and we can make adjustments there. So that's just a little hint. Something else that we do, this has, has grain, of course, but uh, where it says with trim, length trim, what that means is how close can I nest the part to the edge of the sheet. I never want to leave a factory edge. Well, an eighth of an inch works pretty good. So we're going to say don't nest parts any closer than an eighth of an inch, all right? And of course, with you can also put costs and stuff in here, and, and part of the software uh, is the business end that does quotes. We typically don't get involved in that. Our interest is more making parts. Okay, now another library is called templates, and, and here's really what a template is. A template just simply says, this is what I make each part out of. So you might have an oak template, you might have a walnut template, whatever. Uh, you may have a melamine template. But if you notice there, on the list there, there's all the parts and there's this came, these materials came from the material list or the actual catalog. And there are a couple more libraries that have hardware in them, drawer boxes, that kind of stuff. Now, I want to go back to the products library because this is, this is probably the most important thing you're going to do on the front end. Okay, the products are cabinets. And so you have, you have product catalogs and a catalog might be custom cabinet. You can name it what you want. You might have one that's custom cabinets. You might have a catalog that's frameless cabinets. There's an AWI catalog that's in there. There's a closet catalog. So those are all catalogs. And a catalog will have basically every type of cabinet you, you can imagine having. And you can also create your own catalogs. But on the front end of this, let's keep this very simple. We're going to start with a frameless cabinet. And the first thing I'm going to do is bring this frameless cabinet onto the screen. And here's all the information on it. Okay, this is our base cabinet. Let's see how it's put together. So we'll view this, and this will be in SketchUp. So SketchUp is used to give you the visualization, and this is what our cabinet looks like. Now, when I say construction method, it's how wide are the stretchers, what kind of joinery do you use, how does the back mount, how does your toe work, and, and typically our construction method, we use blind dados, and that's because parts fit a certain way, so it's easier for someone to assemble it. We slide the back in after the box is together and it slides into a dado at the bottom because it makes it easier to assemble the cabinet and it squares it once you get it assembled. 
All right, and so this is all part of the Laguna CNC construction method we use for frameless cabinets. And I would recommend that's where you start. You know, you can configure this to make Uncle Joe's cabinet from 40 years ago, but I would recommend that you start here, and you're going to be making cabinets much quicker. Then if, as you get some experience, then you may want to vary a little bit and do some, some changes to it. But you'll be way, way ahead if you'll start with one of these systems that we know works. While we're watching this view, let me show you something that's real interesting. You see these holes on the ends here? Let me get rid of this. Those are drilled. Okay, this is an unfinished end, so it's, it's not going to be exposed. And what we do on these joints, uh, if it's an unfinished end, we drill a hole in there. So when your assembler is putting the cabinet together, there's a screw hole to screw it together. And that hole is actually a drill guide, and it keeps you from putting the screws at an angle. So that's all part of this construction method that just makes this easier. And if you have a part that's finished, you see this is a finished end, there's no holes there. So the software is smart on it, and I would certainly recommend that, that you start with a system like that. And, and oh, by the way, even if you're doing a face frame cabinet, the box is the same. You build a box of the same joinery. The only difference is you have a face frame attached, and the hardware is not related to the cabinet sides. On a frameless drawer guides, if, if we look at this in with ghost view, you see the holes are there for your drawer guides. On a face frame cabinet, you wouldn't have that, so those would be left out. So I would recommend that you standardize how you build the boxes, regardless if it's a face frame or if it's a frameless. Now, the way we make changes to the cabinet design is through these parameters. So if you click on one of them, you'll see there's a whole list of them. Uh, for instance, this one that says uh, dados is where basically you define how deep the, the joints are and how parts fit together. So typically you make a change, you view it on the screen until it looks just right in SketchUp, then you know you've got that done. So. Um, that's how things are customized. Okay, so now in this instance, we've taught the software how we're going to build our base cabinets. And what we did at the catalog level is global, so every time I bring a cabinet in off that catalog, it has that construction bit. Now, if I'm inside a job, I can go in once again and I can change those parameters and make the cabinets different. And I can even change parameters at the individual cabinet level. So there's lots of power in terms of customization. But the secret is to get these configured at the catalog level first, and you'll save a lot of time. Okay, now let's carry this further along. Okay, what's our goal? Our goal is to have a base cabinet built the way we build base cabinets, ready to run on the machine when the installer says the machine's ready. That's our goal. Now let's see what steps are required to get us there. Okay, I've created a new job called Base Test. So it's a test base cabinet, simply what it is. And, and oh, by the way, I would also do the same thing for a wall cabinet and a tall cabinet because those are the three main structures. If you get those right, everything else pretty much works. But let's focus on our test here on the base test. Now, I could create a room and lay the cabinet out, but I don't need to do that. I can just go to order entry. You know, all I've got to do is say, I need a cabinet this size, and it builds it. All right, now one thing I, I did, I made it 23 inches deep because I think I can get all the parts on one sheet of material. That way I don't have to mess with two sheets. Now if, if we're unsure about the cabinet, I can come over here, I can edit it, and I can look at it right there and see, see what it is. Okay, now that looks good. One end is finished, one's unfinished, so that's perfect. If I look at the x-ray, you can tell it's our, it's our construction method. It's the Laguna CNC construction method. That's what I want, so I'm happy there. Okay, now we're going to skip over the business end of this because I, the pricing part, I'm, I'm not interested in Right now, I'm interested in being ready to cut that cabinet out on the machine when the installer's ready. So I click on cut list, I go to optimize, and this turns on the optimizer. I think of optimizing is nesting. All right, now here's what we have. This picked up the material from my material template, so it's, there's the size and there's the spacing. Okay, I'm going to say, oh, oh, and by the way, here's all the parts of that cabinet. In fact, if I wanted to, I could go in and edit anything on that part, but that's probably not what we're going to do at this case. We're going to hit optimize, and there's the, there's the nest. So there's our material, and you notice that the parts are nested not closer than an eighth of an inch to the edge. Here's all your operations. There's your dados. There's the screws and the holes in the bottom to assemble the cabinet. There's your adjustable shelf holes. So it's really, really nice. Now we're at the manufacturing part. We started out with you know, teaching the software how to build our base cabinet. Now we want to validate, is that right? Okay, so now all of a sudden we start talking about machines. So there's a couple things we have to set up. 
One is a machine library. And typically, we're this is going to be a CNC router. This is our default machine. Okay, and then when you hit this setup tab, basically the post processor and some of these other issues, this has to do with where the machine parks when it's over. So those get set up. The other part, CNC, or the tooling. So you'll have a, a tooling library. For instance, or we call them tool sets, and I, I create one just called cabinet set. And I use four tools. So typically on cabinets, I'm going to use four tools. The first tool is going to be a five millimeter drill, and that, that's to drill the assembly holes and to drill the hardware holes and the, and the line bores. The second's going to be a quarter down shear. Our cabinet today, we won't really use that because our dados are larger than that because I'm using a, a thicker back. The third tool is a 3 8 down shear, and so that's a 3 8 tool. A down shear basically is opposite the curve of a drill, so instead of raising the chips out, a down shear pushes them down, and that keeps you from chipping the surface. All right? And then the final tool that we cut things out with will be a 3 8 compression. And I always leave the machine set up that way. I don't vary where those tools go. If I want to do other things with the machines, I use the other, the other tool sets. I use, I use those positions uh, pretty much always for cabinets. So we'll close that, all right? Now our next step, since we've got this done, it's on, on uh, one sheet, our next step is to uh, create the tool pass. So we go to File, we go to G-Code, all right? Generate G-Code, yes and it brings this up. Now the software is pretty smart. It figures out, it has an algorithm that figures out what tool to apply. I don't have to tell it what tool to use, it figures it out. So what I'll do is I'll come over here, I got the tool set, cabinet set, that's correct. I hit calculate and here are the tools it's going to use. The first thing it's going to do is use a five millimeter drill and if I hit the button down here that says simulate what you see on the screen is what happens. It drills those holes. So the machine picks that drill up, moves it around. Okay, the next operation is going to, will be the dados or the pockets, and they're done with a 3 8 down shear. So you can see a pattern here. We do all the non-through machining first. So, so uh, that'll be pretty much drilling and dados in a typical cabinet. That's looking very good. And finally, um, we'll do the outsides. And there's something that you're going to see here that's interesting, and it's how we handle small parts. And what you're going to see is a process we call return onion skin. All right, first up, what's a small part? A small part can have a small surface area. I think our settings on here are 144 inches square, so that's 12 by 12. Or you can have a fairly long part that ha has an area that measures, but if it's narrow, it still may want to move. So our idea with flow through fixturing is to keep as much vacuum available for the small parts as we can and it's real simple the way we do it. First thing we do is we flag which parts are small and I think it's going to be these stretchers. Okay, we're going to go around each one of them and we're going to cut it out and leave an onion skin and that onion skin is about 30,000. So you have really, the vacuum is affected by the entire sheet because it's all still one piece. Then we return back to those and we cut through. So after we return back then those become individual parts. But the cutting pressure for cutting that thin onion skin is so small, uh, the vacuum holes them in place. Okay, so that's called return onion skin. We cut an onion skin and we return back to it. If you can't hold them with that, you can't hold those parts of vacuum. Then finally, what you'll see happen is it'll cut the big parts. Now let's run the simulation and you know what to watch for. So we'll do that. So I hit simulate. Okay, there's the first pass. There's the onion pass, there's the return pass, and there's now we're cutting out the large parts. That looks great. Okay, so now we're ready to run our program. Let's talk about another little issue before we get over there because it, we can see it on here. And that's what do we do with the parts when they're cut? How do we know what's what? And Mosaic has just introduced touchscreen labeling. So the idea is that you have a setup close to the machine with a printer, a label printer, and those are thermal printers so you don't have ink cartridges, and a touchscreen. In my case, I'm using a Windows tablet that happens to have a touchscreen. <clears throat> and what I'm able to do is, is, is to actually select the part I want. Here's what the label is going to look like. 
the label's going to have all the information about the part, what cabinet it goes in, what jobs it in. It'll have a small graphic of what it looks like so you can tell. And you, you select the label that you want and you tell it to print and it prints that label out and you stick it on there. So from that point on, you know what all the parts are. And you may or may not want to do that, but when you get into larger production runs, sometimes it can get really complicated and you can spend more time sorting parts than uh, you spend cutting them. So uh, that's one consideration. So now let's go to the machine. All right, at this point, let's say the installer has come into the office and said, hey, the machine's set up, we're ready to go. Let's make some. So the first thing we're gonna do as part of this formula for success is cut the base cabinet and we're gonna assemble it. And then we're gonna, we're gonna label our parts before we assemble it. So let's go do that. Wow, what a beautiful part. Check out that joiner. Isn't that something? Look at the edge fence. So I was telling you about that's what you get when you have a, a one-piece welded structural steel frame. Those are the kind of edges and accuracy you get. All right, now let's go print some labels. Okay, so we'll print a label. And we'll attach it. That is a cabinet right there, and this is an adjustable shelf. This cabinet came out perfect. It, it's as good as you could ask for. The fit's perfect. All right, so it's it, once again, in part of our formula for success, this is the end result. We cut the base cabinet, we make sure it's right, then we cut the wall cabinet and tall cabinet. And I can tell you, you're gonna be very happy the day you put this cabinet together. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. I, I wanted to accomplish two things with it. One was to show you the touchscreen labeling, but more was to show you the formula for being successful. And if you follow these steps, you'll be successful too, and you'll be very happy when that first cabinet gets assembled on your machine. If you need additional information, call us at 1-800-234-1976, or you can visit us at lagunatools.com. Thank you for watching.